Mary, paying, paying Mary close attention to this because that's an area that he is particularly interested in, among very many others as well. Nebuchadnezzar has been at Yaz, I think, virtually since its inception, even though whenever I call him, he's either just jet-lagged from coming back from somewhere or he's leaving to go somewhere, so we hardly ever get to see each other anymore. He's also convening lead author of the second and third assessment reports of the IPCC on the climate change. He's a professor for energy economics at the Technical University in Vienna. And at Yaza, he's a leader of the energy and transition to new technology programs. So you can imagine he doesn't really have time for old friends. Uh, but I'm sure he has time to give you a very interesting presentation. It's called The Changing World, Energy, Climate, and Social Futures. Professor Nagichenkovich. Thank you, Michael, for this kind introduction. Uh, let me first say it's a real privilege that I have an opportunity to talk to you this afternoon. But I also have to submit that I'm quite overwhelmed with these last two days. I have to say it's really overwhelming to see so many friends and colleagues with whom I've worked over the last 35 years, to see so many of the ASA directors here who have shaped the nature of this institute, and also many people with whom we are working right now and collaborating, including many of my colleagues from the university. As Michael said in the introduction, I'll talk about the changing worlds, and I would try to take a perspective of energy, of climate, and derive some of the social implications and possible response strategies. So let me first list uh, some of the major issues that I think are associated with global change. First of all and foremost, and that's my bias, I think that access to sustainable energy services is essential. It's essential for achieving MDGs, but I think it's also essential even in the longer period for achieving any other development goals. And for that, we have to provide in an environmentally compatible way energy services as well as ecosystem services. We have to do it in such a way that we can achieve really deep, massive reductions of greenhouse gases, improve the performance of the systems and technologies at the same time, for example, enhance the reliability and security of systems. And foremost, and I think that's essential for all of those elements and the ones that Jeffrey Sachs addressed, is enhance research and development and investment into the new systems. And that, of course, requires much more resources. So let me start my brief presentation by showing you a perspective of the Earth from above the North Pole. I like it particularly because it shows some of the aspects of global change, namely that we can expect, this is a, a past picture, we can expect that over the next few decades the ice cover will be disappearing. That's one of the aspects. So when we take this picture in the middle of the century, it will look probably quite different. The other thing that I would like to highlight, if you look to the, down to the picture and to the right, you see the nighttime lights of North America and Europe. And this is, I think, a real strong tentail sign of uh, humanity's presence on the Earth that you can see from very far away. Focusing just on Europe, uh, look at the, uh, the, the shiny part of Benelux countries. Uh, this is the part of the world where not only you have very high level, exceedingly high level of energy services, but this is also where the people live. That's where the affluence is. And unfortunately, also, this is where much of the emissions, in particular greenhouse gas emissions, are taking place. So let me just uh, give you a little brief historical introduction and then talk a little bit about future possibilities. And I would start with this, what I think is perhaps the biggest change in the world. Anne Goujon talked about that. Jeffrey Sachs also addressed the issue of population. I think it's essential. Here you see the three grand transitions that in, in the uh, carrying capacity of the Earth. On the horizontal scale is the past, going back to a million years. On the vertical scale is number of the people in the world. And I would argue that during the last 20,000 years, climate has been very kind to us, so we were able to uh, develop agriculture, and starting some 10 to 20 uh, to 5,000 years ago, we started a huge revolution, agricultural early civilizations that have expanded the human population from half a dozen million to a couple of hundred million worldwide. And the most deepest revolution was the last one, the Industrial Revolution, where the humanity grew from about 1 billion people 200 years ago to 6.5 billion today. Let me share with you some of the other signs of this development. The first one, I think really essential, 
urbanization. You see here the history of urbanization since the beginning of the industrialization, but also scenarios for the future. And I think there is no doubt that the world conti will continue urbanizing. The question is to what degree. But what is significant, if you look at today, that we are reaching the 50% mark of the urbanization. So from now on, more people will be added to the cities, and this is also what Jeffrey Sachs mentioned. How about this development? Um, this is from my colleagues at YASA in the population program. This shows the higher level education in the world, the share of people with a higher education. Notice that this is also a very dynamic, very pervasive historical process, but we are here as well on the 50% mark. So looking forward to the next century or so, we can expect that we will have much more educated world living predominantly in the cities. And the third one that maybe many of you have not seen based on the work of George Modelsky, I think quite significant, the spread of pluralistic uh, pluralistic systems of governance. And curiously enough, here we also have the 50% mark. So if you look toward the end of the century or middle of the century, I think also the new governance systems have to emerge that will deal with these global issues that are long term and pervasive. So I think the, how, how did some of these developments change that have uh, also altered fundamentally the fabric of our societies and will no doubt do that over the next coming decades? Well, again, my argument is. It is the availability of energy services. Here you see the primary energy evolution in the world over the last 150 years. If you look back in time, in the days before fossil energy, most of the energy was non-commercial, biomass, and other renewable sources. And then when the coal came, you can see within a couple of decades, the energy demand doubled. And then with the introduction of oil and gas, we really had an explosive development. But it was essential, despite the negative things we see today. This energy has replaced the human and animal labor and has freed us from more creative activities. And the question is how we are going to do this in the post-fossil area because we have, as you can see, 80% of energy is fossil today in the world. So I'll talk a little bit later about possible transitions. Let me just summarize, well, summarize some of the negative consequences of this really impressive development, and that is on the climate. This comes from the fourth assessment report of the IPCC. It shows the mean global temperature increasing by about 0.75 degrees Celsius during this period of industrialization and what IPCC concludes, and I think this is particularly concerning, you can see that the trend is accelerating, and on top of it, the last 12 years have been also the warmest on the record. So let me just wrap this historical introduction a bit and uh, share with you that the global population has increased sixfold during the last two centuries of industrialization. The economic affluence has probably increased another order of magnitude so that in principle we are ten times better off than our ancestors. For that energy was required. And please note that energy increased 35-fold. That's with the square of population. This is something that we have to break through new and innovative technologies and new forms of behavior. Uh, carbon emissions that I've just shown you before with their climate implications have increased about 20 times. So there was a minute, minute degree of decarbonization over the last two centuries. Now there is a dark side to this story that was, can you please advance the figure? It's not coming, uh, the, go to the next slide. It's not going forward. I wanted to show you next the dark story of this side of this development by indicating the heterogeneity and uh, that you heard yesterday from the dinner speech from Pronk very clearly. This is for a great collection of photographs of Peter Mansell that I would, if you have time, please do look at them. They're really interesting. This is a displaced family in Chad of four people with all of their food for a week, including water. I would like to highlight that. Contrast that to a situation where we are living in Europe, in North America, also a four-person family with their food for a week. I, I'm sure that you can guess that most of this food will be thrown away despite the obesity problems. Another two pictures, a family in Mali with all of their belongings. Uh, look at to the right of the picture, fuel wood and water containers, probably the children, their felt members of this family, children and women, have spent hours collecting fuel, wood and water, and all of the ut utensils are non-commercial. They have to do with energy, with gathering food. 
a family in Japan, one of the most efficient uh, OECD countries, note that there is a motor vehicle, a private home, and many, many electric gadgets. So access to modern energy is essential for development, and I would like to illustrate that to you. How does it look from the space? Another luminosity figure, very, very high degree of luminosity, very high degree of energy services in most of the industrialized countries. And now I would like to go to a dynamic spatial representation that's a little bit what Jeffrey Sachs talked about, and I'll show you our spatial model based on the scenario that we, with the other modeling teams, developed for the IPCC. So please look how the luminosity might look in 70 years from now. And I think it is, in many ways, a real challenging picture. Now, let me mention this scenario is called day two. This is where population almost doubles. It's a difficult world, despite some economic growth, and it remains to be quite predominantly fossil. And so when the emissions of this world are assessed with the climate models, and this is uh, an average of an ensemble of all of the models. You can see the mean global temperature change. It's about four degrees toward the end of the century, plus the 0.7 that I've talked about. So we are talking about the world in the five degree change and in the northern latitudes even more than that. So this is, I think, a serious reason for concern. Here is how the energy system might look like behind this scenario. We are going deeper into coal, in particular India, China, United States, Russia, Australia. Oil and gas are losing their market shares, but there is quite lots of renewables and nuclear. But what's important here is to note that the primary energy demand is increasing rapidly. A contrast to that, a scenario that's much more leaner. It's much greener scenario, B1, where we do a lot to improve the efficiency of the energy system. Coal stays the same, but there is quite a lot of pressure on providing renewable energy sources in addition to nuclear. And so this is the type of future that would have a much slower fingerprint on the environment in general. How far do we have to go with the emissions? Well, that scenario that I showed you also implies about a three degree warming. So it's still far away from the two degrees. And this shows from the fourth assessment report of the IPCC how our future emissions against the past, historical emissions, need to look if we want to achieve 450 ppm or two degrees. So let me just highlight some of the features. By 2030, and Stan alluded to that a little bit, I believe, by 2030, almost a 50% decline. By 2050, almost an 85, up to 85% decline. And what's daunting is perhaps toward the end, end of the century even negative emissions. So how could that possibly happen? Well, one of the strategies is to use biomass with carbon capture and storage, but that in itself has many, many difficulties. And look at the other uh, trajectories. The top one, the gray one, is a world of about six to perhaps even eight degree warming on average, and even there the emissions have to peak by the middle of the century. So even if we want to commit ourselves to deeper climate change, one way or the other the emissions have to go down. So now what I would like to do briefly is build up on what Stan showed. He showed the current maps. I'm showing you maps based on our integrated assessment work at IASA across many, many of the groups for the scenario that has shown, for the more sustainable scenario, B1, where the people will be living in 70 years from now. You see very high population concentrations in India, for example, and many developing worlds. Where will be the aerial land? Well, there where the people are living. That's why they're living there, because the land is good for living. But remember that that scenario has lots of biomass. So where would we be growing that biomass? Well, this is the extent of land that might be going to the biomass. Very difficult to imagine from the present point of view, but this is an implication of doing that work. And we have identified in a number of areas with a conflict of land use, the marked in red out there, and I think this is a very important area of future work to look where the conflicts might emerge and try to look at how we can find solutions simultaneously. Well, I would like to show you a couple of pictures before concluding. Number one, so if the biomass is a possible solution, this is one of the most successful biomass programs, ethanol in Brazil, despite all of the ecological and other difficulties we have heard. Economically, it has been a real success. The price of ethanol has gone down threefold, while, as you know, oil price has gone up to almost $90. 
this didn't happen. This was not a free lunch. It, ha it didn't happen by itself. It happened because Brazilian society invested about two billion into this program. And yet, look at the smokestacks. So there is still quite a lot of work to do before is, this is really sustainable from my point of view. But we have to develop other technologies, and this is why investments required. This is carbon and capture in North Sea, Sleipner platform. Uh, where, as you can see in the picture, gas is extracted deep from the North Sea to the platform, CO2 is separated and piped into an underground aquifer. That happens because Norway has a CO2 tax there, but unfortunately it's really a pilot project. It's only about one million tons of CO2 per year. The second project listed up there, the Weyburn project, is I think also exceedingly interesting. Uh, there is a gasification power plant in U.S. where CO2 is separated, piped to Canada, and used for enhanced oil recovery of a depleted field, and thereby, basically, oil also becomes carbon neutral because for every ton of oil, one approximately injects one ton of carbon. But all of these pro uh, projects have to be commercialized, and we have to go from million tons to billion tons. That's the nature of the challenge. But I would say it's not a supply story alone. This is what I really would like to highlight. We need to change, I think, the very fabric of how we behave. This is an electric car, Tesla car, that you can order and pay, but you cannot take the delivery yet. It's not available. This is a car that could be made, but you cannot buy it either. It's um, a methane hybrid. This is a prototype made in Switzerland. This could run on biogas or natural gas, but would pave the road for zero vehicle transport. And I think that's our biggest challenge, is mobility. Uh, here is a, a hydrogen vehicle that was presented at the Tokyo Motor Show. That's a radical departure from the cars that we are driving, certainly from the Hummers and SUVs. But public transport is essential. This is an EU project where you see a hydrogen fuel cell bus. But the key thing here is, again, infrastructure, not just bringing, building prototype vehicles, but having experience and learning. And a two-polyev design for a hydrogen or a methane aircraft of the future that we might have to travel on. Let me just say that the Tupolev Bureau is one of the leading companies in this area. Twenty years ago, they already flew with a methane and a hydrogen-powered aircraft. And an app revision, supergrid, where we might be transporting clean energy carriers such as electricity and hydrogen, and perhaps also people in the largely urbanized parts of the world and the last thing I wanted to show you is, since the world might be warming anyway, despite all of the great efforts, we will have to adapt. This is a Dutch vision of adapting at a very high degree of affluence, level of affluence, a floating house. Notice that the swimming pool is also floating. I find that a very charming detail. And so what I would like to show you is a kind of a, this is a European vision for roughly 2050 of, of a, of a low carbon society, I would call it zero carbon society. And I would like to show you how radically this, the world might look. And the emphasis is on the systems, not individual components, but how to make the systems work. In the foreground, lots of carbon capture and storage, in particular in depleted oil and gas fields, but also underground aquifers. But in the middle ground here, you can see huge new infrastructures, electricity, hydrogen, CO2, conversion plants, photovoltaic arrays, solar thermal on the mountain, wind power plants, then hydropower plant, and somewhere around, I'm sure there are also nuclear power plants perhaps behind the mountain, so we don't see them directly. So what I would like to conclude with is just say a few words about what are the investments that might be required, at least from the energy point of view. And I think we have to do that in other areas. This is where new integrated assessments will be required, and not only to try to calculate, so to say, to count the beans, but also understand better where the investments might be coming from. And so this is based on the work of my colleagues at YASA, again, with the integrated assessment model I showed you the land use from. Here are the investments in the energy sector for the two scenarios that I briefly described. On the left is an emissions intensive world with lots of people. On the right is a leaner world that has much, much lower emissions that can lead to a two degree world with some extra mitigation. Now, in, you can see that the investments are roughly the same. It's about 10% more to be in a leaner world. Um, but in both cases, that would recover basically doubling the current investments to about 1,000 billion per year or 20 trillion 
to 2030. If you look on the right, and I think this is really a possibly significant result of our work connected with technology dynamics that was mentioned by Jeffrey Sachs, is that because this scenario would be based on innovative new technologies, there is a high degree of learning in the systems context, and we estimate that the future investments would be substantially lower, not only the emissions. So it looks at the first glance as a win-win strategy. So I'm now also in my red time. Let me conclude. Um, I hope that I have shown you that the magnitude of these challenges is absolutely huge and that the real problem is how to find a way forward by resolving many of these issues at the same time. And uh, my point of view is we need, we need a paradigm shift, a fundamental paradigm shift. Nothing short of that will work in the energy area. Huge improvement in the end use. Where pe how people live and what they do, introduction of advanced technologies such as nuclear and renewables, and lots of carbon capture and storage. I think we will have to do that over the next few decades. Let me just end up by saying that uh, a year ago, some of us, colleagues from IASA and other international partners, have started, launched the Global Energy Assessment. You see the website, globalenergyassessment.org. If you're interested in this, please look. We hope that this assessment will pave the road forward of how to make the next generation of investments and avoid some of these global problems we, we talked about. Thank you very much.